שלום from Israel, thank you. Uh, we want to welcome you for coming this morning for this important event. Uh, Abinav, thank you so much. Perfect. Uh, first of all, good morning uh, to you know, all my friends, all the participants who are here and uh, all the esteemed panelists and also a very warm thank you and good morning to uh, Honorable Kobi Shoshani, sir, who has joined us today as a keynote speaker. It's a real pleasure and an honor to have Kobi Shoshani, sir, uh, as our today's keynote speaker. And uh, once again, I would say that this event is, is uh, very important for the choice of the topic uh, which uh, we have decided for today. But uh, apart from that, this also makes a very strong landmark in USANA's foundation's friendship with Israel. In the past, uh, we uh, did two events uh, uh, on one Israel's foreign policy and other on the religious discourse in West Asia with the help of our India-Israel Affairs coordinator, Nina Slama. And we got some really amazing speakers uh, from Israel. After that, uh, we also had this recent Maharana Pratap Annual Security Dialogue, which had a very good number of speakers from Israel. And uh, our Ambassador Gillon joined us as the chief guest, chief guest in the inaugural session. And once again, after this event, we are having this uh, event today with, in partnership with Dr. Tal Pavel, the Institute Cyber Bureau, the Institute for Cyber Policy Studies. It's a real pleasure and an honor. And uh, I would also like to welcome all the esteemed panelists today for a very critical topic because uh, as we also recently discussed in our MPAST uh, Maharana Pratap Annual Security Dialogue uh, about the new challenges uh, coming from uh, cyber, cyber related domains in the world of terror also. I have worked in Kashmir over the last four or five years and I have seen how this online radicalization is at play on the ground and how it can wreak havoc, it can facilitate recruitment, the encrypted communication technologies can make the things very smooth and easy for the terrorist organizations and in Kashmir, most of these terror groups have been experimenting with different kind of encryption apps and a different kind of, uh, I would say, you know, Twitter spaces and all these things. So the cyber domain is certainly a big challenge. And uh, I mean, since today's topic is more about the terrorist organizations and cyber security threat, but, uh, the, in a, but it, uh, on its own, the cyber security threat uh, goes beyond the world of terrorism also. And uh, it also includes the state actors and the global intelligence agencies also using it to, to sabotage national interest. But, uh, but I mean, today's, focus is on terror groups so i'll just you know i'm not uh, getting into that and uh, once again a very warm welcome and thank you so much for joining okay yeah, from now from here i'll just hand it over to lauren uh, degan she is a moderator for today's event so she'll be conducting the event from here lauren over to you thank you so much <laughs> Kofi Shoshani is currently served as the Consul General of the Israel uh, in Mumbai, India. He served the first security and consul in the embassies of Israel in Bangkok and Tokyo from 1997 to uh, 20, 20, uh, sorry, 2002. He has served in uh, Brussels as a Minister of Management Affairs in the Israeli mission to EU. He was also the head of division of internal inception of the Ministry of Affairs. Mr. Shashani, please. Thank you, Loren. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Professor Abinav. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tal. Uh, uh, thank you, Loren. Uh, it's very happy to see uh, faces that I know uh, from the past. Um, uh, today, topics, as you have mentioned before, and I would like to start with something which is a little bit strange. It's uh, with my childhood. And you will see within a second, I'm going to do it in a very short way. Uh, how is uh, the connection to that? I was uh, born in Jerusalem in 1966, before 1967, before the Six Days War. And uh, I was born to a family which was, uh, let's say, splitted. Not splitted because my parents love each other. My father, uh, before 1948, like India in 1947, when you got your independence, he was. He was part of the, let's uh, call it the right-wing group. Uh, let's say he was not a nice guy uh, towards uh, the British. Of course, he was at that time was very young. But my mother came from a family uh, which is actually center-left. Uh, right. on. If I would like to say in uh, Indian terms, uh, my father came from the RSS, 
of the BJP of today. And my mother came from uh, the Congress party. Maybe it will uh, make you uh, more or less uh, uh, understanding what was the idea and the fighting internally in the, in the family, especially with the family gathering in the, in the... And why I'm telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because I think that as a child, I was, uh, as I mentioned, I was born in 1966, six, long after the independence of Israel and of course of India, the parties actually became uh, from the region of the ideological part of, of, uh, of uh, towards the British mandate, toward, towards, uh, and that was the parties in Israel at that time. But I, I've heard the conversation between my families, between my father, especially because he was alone in, uh, around the family of my mother, uh, there is something which was in common to everybody. Everybody loves Israel. Everybody wants uh, uh, to secure and to be, I mean, Israel was above everything. And, and I think this is the most important thing for security, uh, security uh, uh, concept. Uh, the social consolidation is the most important part of the security element in countries under risk. And Israel and India are sharing more or less the same uh, the same uh, uh, threats, uh, the same uh, conflicts, but by the way, not only in security, also in water, in, in, in a lot of uh, variety of things. Uh, um, uh, we have minority, uh, which is uh, very influential, and I think uh, we have to give them a respect for that. Uh, and we live to, to be, I mean, to, and the question of being, you know, if, uh, India to be a, a country of uh, Hindustan or uh, like in Israel is a Jewish state. There is a lot of elements that uh, we are sharing together and it will come into security, is security issues uh, afterwards. But the most important thing is to love your country. I think this is the basic, I'm not talking about politics right now, but I'm talking about the concept of security. If in India in 1965 or in 1971 or in Israel in 1967 or in 1973 or even in 1982, the war started with the military maneuvering with tanks and soldiers that are crossing the borders, I assume that uh, our next war, I hope that it won't happen, yes, start completely different. They, I assume this is, uh, an, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an officer in the Israeli army. I started in a signal corps in the intelligence forces. Uh, and uh, I assume that right now everything completely changed. The new war going to start, let me, try to give, open your imagination. All the uh, lights in the very specific uh, roads going to be green, then it will be accidents and block the roads. I assume that uh, all the water uh, uh, purification, the salination, they are going to make a cyber against them and you will not have a, a drinkable water in your taps. And uh, of course, uh, uh, other elements in the electricity and, and, uh, and other fields, of course, uh, cellular uh, networks and communication system will not work properly. That's going to be the first two hours of the next war. And the big question that I'm asking myself, first of all, maybe this element of cyber can change completely the advantage of the military, uh, the military advantage. And this is questions that bother myself for many, many uh, uh, years already, and what we should do towards that. And I think that uh, some countries, and I think that India is not in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this group, and I'm sure that Israel is not, they understood that the advantage of the military uh, that we have is, uh, is not enough. We have to be prepared to, uh, to a, a point that our advantage is actually collapsed this way or another because of some bites that moving from this to, to there and, it's, and you don't feel it sometimes. And eventually you find yourself in a situation that you are dealing backward. And if I come back to my story uh, as a child, I think that it's uh, extremely important because eventually in the end of the day, the strength of the, of the people in, internally is extremely important. What I see in India and what I see in Israel, which not make me happy at all, I have to say. You know, in Israel, uh, we call it the uh, talkbacks. In, in India, we call the, you call it uh, comments. I see all the time the comments uh, between the political parties in India and Israel. And I, what I've seen in Israel and what I see in India is almost the same thing because I make this 
automatic translation of all these uh, uh, comments. And I see the same hatred and the same um, uh, wording that uh, both the states are using, uh, both parties, I'm all the fans of these parties using, which uh, thing, I think uh, this is something which is very bad in my point of view. We should uh, change the language if we would like to, uh, uh, to open the next generation of war in a better way, because the, the people who are actually um, going to, to, to pay for the war is not, o- not always soldiers. And I have a lot of respect to soldiers and, and, and mainly it's going to be the citizen, the habitants, missiles, rockets that are going to be sent uh, to the center of cities. And uh, this is something that, that we have to prepare and we are united. And, and I'm say all the time in India and also in Israel, the same thing. You should have a conflict, political conflict, which is fantastic and good. I like it very much. I'm, I like politics very much, but like my mother and my father that was actually love each other. They are not sharing the same attitude. And, uh, and it, what, it was a lot of respect between the parties in the family gathering. Then let's think about, think about it as a, a point of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of just for a few moments, if we should uh, change sometimes the language in order to help and to assist the security or to, to strengthen the security element of our two beloved state. I, I don't know if I have a possibility to share screen, uh, uh, Professor Abinav, I don't know if who can give me the, I would like to show maybe two or three uh, slides, if I have time for that, of course. Uh, if I can do it, I will be more than happy. If not, I, uh, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do it. Uh, you can, I think. You know, so it, oh, uh, it, sure, we have enough time. You know, if, if you yes. have a screen sharing option, uh, you, if you start oh, your it, presentation... It, 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 and, uh, host is able uh, uh, to share sc- screening. That's what is... Really I agree. Okay. Just a second, I'll give you... Just a second, uh, Mr. Shoshani. Yeah. Yes, you can now. For a second, uh, great. I don't know if you see the, you see the screen. Yeah, uh, we can see. Then, uh, and this is just uh, the beginning. Then I, I spoke about most of the things and uh, about the population. I spoke about uh, this, uh, the game changer, the cyber. I don't know if uh, the advantage, the, mi- the military advantage, going to prevail. Uh, because of the uh, of the element of uh, the cyber, which I think extremely important, and I think I would like to show you something which is. Um, Mr. Shani, can you please uh, um, um, transfer it to uh, present mode? That's it. Yeah, here. Well, I would like uh, this slide. You know, the most important thing, and which is extremely important, I think, the most important thing in a cyber, we should cooperate. The good ones need to cooperate, and I think. And sorry to conclude, Israel and India, we are the good guys here. We should cooperate. We we should shift. Uh, we should uh, shift uh, information. We should uh, uh, collaborate in any uh, terror information. That's the main topic and the most important thing. And uh, you know, in 1992, it was my first time to visit India. You know, that was the day that we actually have a full diplomatic relation, India and Israel. For many, many years, you can see the color, the orange color, India and Israel hasn't had full diplomatic relation before 1991. I came to India in 1992, uh, right after the establishment and opening the embassy of uh, Israel in New Delhi. I was a young diplomat that was sent to, uh, to Connaught Place. The embassy was there, there in Connaught Place. Uh, and uh, I have to say that at that time, uh, the influence of, uh, uh, the concept of the unaligned uh, uh, concept and the, the good relations that uh, Indira Gandhi had with the, with the Arab state, the security element was hidden this way or another aside. And uh, when we came to New Delhi, we everybody looked at us, especially in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as you know, a little bit strangers. You know, who are the, this Israeli with all these security requests and things like that? But the time has passed, and you see what's happened in 1992. In 1995, you can see the, the green, the green uh, map is actually the countries that Israel have a full diplomatic relations. Uh, this is because it happened in, in Madrid, the conference, and the, of course, uh, Oslo Accord, 
and uh, and uh, and you will see and you will see uh, right now in 2001 only few uh, states uh, that uh, they don't we don't have a full diplomatic relation why is it important because the cooperation between states against cyber security is a crucial to all this uh, uh, to the the, the security uh, question here and i think that the people uh, uh, should understand just a few words about india and israel which i think it's uh, important why and why and why is important for me to mention it um first of all we are um, uh, we have a lot of we, lo we have a lot of uh, 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 things in common from nobel laureates both states have nine Nobel laureates in each side, and of course a lot of uh, Jewish uh, Christians from all over the world. Um, we are uh, you're, 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 today. I, I understood that you are number five in world production, which is amazing. I think and this is part of the uh, Prime Minister Modi's plan making India, and I think it's a very good thing, very good plan to India. There is a lot of problems with that. I know that most of the businessmen don't like this making India project, but I think it's good for India. You are jumped from 3% to 3.1%. And because of the COVID and other elements, India become number fifth in the world. We are number six uh, in, 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 in several things. Um, you, you have an amazing industry. I'm saying not because I'm speaking to, uh, I live in India and I'm speaking to people from India because I saw it in my eyes. I'm visiting very often Pune, Gujarat, I see the industry, I see the young generation, which is amazing. I think that we should cooperate. And I think uh, the visit of uh, Prime Minister Modi in Israel, and of course the visit of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the former Prime Minister Netanyahu in India, actually give a big boost to the relation. And it, today you can see the love between uh, something which is also including in the military strength and everybody can take it. Uh, first of all, this is the, the world production right now. This is the accurate one, 2021. Of course, China is leading and the dependence of uh, China bring a lot of uh, tension because of uh, global you know, uh, trade and things like that, of course, with the States and, and other uh, countries, but the dependence uh, of the world in the, the Chinese production, also in India, whether you like it or not, it's extremely high. But we saw that India, because of, I think because of making India, moved and passed already South Korea. South Korea was 3.3% right now. 3% maybe because of the COVID, I, I'm not. But right now you are uh, in the way up. It will bring a lot of challenges like, you know, water and climate change and electricity uh, shortage. But you need to think about it and also about cyber and, and security because to produce more, you need more electricity. Um, stuck, but uh, but but uh, uh, oh, just few fields of cooperation that we have right now. We have acceleration in Gujarat. It's called I Create, and we are trying uh, to do a, a cooperation between Indian young talented generation and Israel young uh, generation, and to open a new markets. We should uh, do adaptation to our prices and our items, and of course to bring uh, the possibility of uh, India. Uh, of industry, industry of India into a big, uh, bigger uh, scale. We have more than uh, 30 centers of excellence of, in agriculture, fantastic. I saw some of them, especially in um, the states of uh, my jurisdiction. And I think it's fantastic to see farmers that tell, tell me that they, their uh, growth, growth actually rose from in 60% since they started to work with the centers Indo-Israeli centers of excellence in agriculture make me make me uh, so happy. We have a health agreement. We are planning to do some Bollywood uh, films. I'm very big fan of uh, this industry, and I met several Bollywood. I, I have to always say that my favorite film actor uh, actress actually is Vidya Balan. Probably uh, most of the people know her, and she's I met her. She's amazing, the lady. I think she's one of the best uh, film actors, actor and actress in India. And uh, we have a water project in Uttar pa Uta Pradesh, which uh, is, uh, uh, and I hope that it will succeed and bring solution to water because water is extremely important to both states. And of course, what last but not least is the FTA, the free zone agreement. And I think that uh, there, we are starting very uh, soon the cooperation and the talks about making India and Israel a free trade zone. 
And I think it's give a boost to the relations. And believe me, the neighbors above, without mentioning the names, look at it. They see the cooperation between Israel, India, United Arab Emirates, United States. Nobody likes it. And nobody likes it because they know exactly the, to understand the power and the strength of all these four economies. And, uh, and it comes into security reason as well, especially to Pakistan. What's happened in Afghanistan is uh, quite, uh, it's quite uh, complicated. And actually very sad, I have to say, uh, see what's happened to women down there. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's not uh, easy to read and to see, but uh, you, you, you have a very big challenge in uh, Afghanistan and, uh, and, uh, and also in, in Pakistan. And you have to think about it, uh, if it's good or bad, what's happened in Afghanistan. I have a completely a little bit, uh, and this is my private, of course, uh, thought. I think from security point of view, I'm not sure that it's so bad uh, to India, but this is my personal uh, uh, thought. This is the centers of excellence that we have all over the States. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much right now. If you have, of course, if I speak too much, let me know. I'm so sorry for that, but uh, Questions are going to be in the end, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shoshani, the Consul General of, to, of Israel to Mumbai, India. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, we, are, we really appreciate it. Right. To uh, Dr. Tal Pavel, the director. Sorry, I, I have a little problem here. Sorry. The founder and director of the Institute of for Cyber Policy Studies Israel. Tal, it's yours. Thank you very much, Loren. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Shani, honorable um, guest speakers, uh, uh, Mr. Akinab, my uh, partner for this event. Thank you everyone for uh, being here. Um, I would like to have a short presentation uh, about since our the theme of this event is terrorist organizations in South Asia and cyber threats to national security, I'd like to take um, a few moments to uh, kind of uh, review brief on terrorist organizations uh, and the online activity, not necessarily cyber, but online activity how do um, terrorist organizations in the Middle East uh, use the digital sphere? So, um, just a second. I'll share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Marvelous. <clears throat> okay. So, tourism in the digital world. We know that um, we have life cycle of tourist activity. And here I will cover a few of those uh, stations in the um, life cycle of tourist activity and how do they use the digital sphere, the subspace, the online world, um, you know, just glimpse. First of all, there is the call between how do they disseminate the um, reason, the call, the cause, and we, in most cases, the Islamic State, um, we can see the banners, the poster that um, um, they uh, disseminate, in this case, um, Oi Pu Oi and Al Ain Bil Ain, which is eye for eye, the same thing in French and Arabic, um, after uh, the attack in, uh, in in Belgium, um, in the same, they were very, very sophisticated um, in um, all their online activity and distributed uh, 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 um, the message. Another aspect is the ideological guidance. The Islamic State had a um, Facebook account for the scholars. It's amazing but there was a Facebook account, as can seen here, for Islamic State scholars, <clears throat> in which 
anyone who poses a question, uh, a, a religious, cleric form, and receive answers, but from the scholars of Islamic State. Another thing, another stage in this life cycle is the mobilization. And we can see that um, um, they try to recruit followers, sympathizers, activists, even through Viber and <clears throat> social media accounts. And as you can see here, FBI director, maybe thousands recruited by ISIS in US alone, mainly, as you can see, using Twitter and Facebook. When it's come to the next stage, the funding, <clears throat> We know that Islamic State have wide range of uh, funding uh, 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 facilities. Uh, one of them is Bitcoin, <clears throat> with the claim in this case that uh, those who perpetrated the uh, Paris attack had um, a wallet of $3 million in Bitcoin. I don't know whether it's true or false, but this was the claim. Uh, Hamas as well. Uh, try to uh, raise funds using Bitcoin, and it's written here in Arabic that uh, uh, this is a message from um, the um, Islamic wing of, um, um, uh, pardon, the military wing of uh, Hamas, and the it was uh, written here in Arabic that uh, it's uh, a message of uh, beginning uh, receiving this, the uh, financial support for their resistance, which means Hamas, using the um, um, Bitcoin, um, using this official um, wallet address of Bitcoin of Hamas. <clears throat> For that purpose, there was also kind of, um, um, perhaps not a fatwa, but uh, cleric um, approval, justification, um, that anyone could, uh, raise fund and um, give his uh, assets in case of need um, using Bitcoin to the cause of the terrorist organization. That's written here, uh, Bitcoin and the charity of violent physical struggle. Bitcoin was Sadaka that she had <clears throat> and can be found uh, easily on the uh, web as well as campaigns to raise funds, <clears throat> sniper rifles, um, AK-47, RPG, and, and so on and so forth. When it comes to operational training, <clears throat> we had uh, magazines and uh, guides like this one, How to Survive in the West, a Mujahid guide, with a quote from Abu Musab al zarqawi and you can see here the chapters hiding the extremist identity, internet privacy, modern weapon, bomb making, what happens when you are supplied on and get traded, and so on and so forth. And as you can see in here, can easily be found on the internet, which means, once again, the, uh, uh, the power of the internet to disseminate such content and Inspire, which was a magazine of uh, AQAP, Al-Qaeda and Arabic Peninsula, with this article, How to Make a Bomb in the Kitchen of Your Mind, by, uh, by the Al-Qaeda chef. And here as well, exclusive interview with the Al-Qaeda chef. Um, Islamic State uh, issued um, this uh, very interesting um, and look very professional magazine, which was called The Big, um, including interviews, and it was very, very professional one. When it's come to communication, they knew definitely how to use um, mass media and online communication. Uh, one of the uh, um, best examples is the onslaught on the uh, um, mall in um, Nairobi, Kenya, by Boko Haram, or oh, pardon, the Shabab from Somalia. As can seen here, 
tweeting terrorism, how Al Shabaab live blocked the Nairobi attacks, which mean those guys from the Al Shabaab from Somalia that um, attacked the, the mall in Nairobi, tweeted during the event on Twitter. As you can see, Nairobi shopping mall attacks Al Shabaab Twitter account suspect, suspect, suspended. Pardon. Another very interesting tool that was allegedly used for communication and perhaps even training is PlayStation. And it was amazing to reveal, well, according to uh, a declaration statement by uh, the Belgian Minister of uh, Home Affairs, who claimed that terrorists that, that plot the Paris attack use place, PlayStation 4 in order to communicate between themselves and fly below the radar and to um, um, not only communicate, but to get trained in this uh, environment. Um, <clears throat> another interesting is the ability to assimilate modern uh, technologies. Uh, just uh, uh, for example, this one, the um, Zillow application that I must admit that up until then I never heard about it, but it's an application that um, um, transformed our cell phone into PPT uh, devices, which consume less energy. So several years ago, the um, activists, uh, the activists of uh, Islamic State used this application and had the official account, as you can see in the Dawlat al Khilaf al Islamia, Islamic State. Um, in addition, they used uh, encryption software. Uh, if you know PGP software, which is <clears throat> last year celebrated 30 years, uh, an open source uh, US um, encryption software made by uh, individual <clears throat> received um, Arabization of the GUI, of the graphic user interface. They call it Asra al-Mujahideen, the secret of the warriors. And here you can see, it's written here in Arabic, Asra al-Mujahideen. You can see <clears throat> in, um, kind of instructions how to use this encryption software uh, published by um, the uh, Islamic State. Um, in addition, they have vast um, activities on Telegram. This is a poster um, with the uh, invitation to join the Telegram account accounts, I might say. Um, <clears throat> and a very uh, visual one with uh, instructions how to uh, download and how to install and how to um, uh, log in to the um, Telegram account. And as you can see here from the different languages, they had dozens of operating um, Telegram accounts, with dozens of languages. And one of them is also was a technical one. Uh, um, it's written here in Arabic, the technical office. Uh, Hamas as well had their own, they had, by the way, from my own experience, I can tell you that uh, Hamas and the military wing, uh, is the uh, is a brigade, have several Twitter, uh, pardon, have several um, um, Telegram accounts um, in Arabic, English, and even in Hebrew. They have uh, even a Telegram account in Hebrew um, with a very good um, um, level in, in, in that language. <clears throat> As can see here, Telegram was widely spread and uh, used by Islamic State, more than Twitter. Uh, ISIS use of Telegram was definitely surpassed. Uh, uh, Twitter, <clears throat> they even created their own application. And as you can see here, this is from almost uh, 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 eight years ago, um, 2014. They created the application of news, uh, of um, which was also for a very short period of time 
um, one can found it on uh, uh, Google Play, <clears throat> and then it was, of course, removed by Google. <clears throat> Another very interesting attempt was to create this one, which was called Khilafa Book, the Facebook of Khilafa, the Facebook of um, Islamic State. And as can seen here, it looks exactly as, well, very, very similar to Facebook. But you can see here the flag <clears throat> of Islamic State and the banner of, um, if you know Arabic, uh, it's, it's called the Shahada. Um, they also created, um, produced a um, flag team, in this case, of the news agency, Amak. And yes, Islamic State had their own news agency. Once again, it's called Amak. And here there is a poster with instructions how to insert this flag in to Firefox, in this case, browser that will enable you to receive in push, in streaming, news from Islamic State uh, uh, news agency. And as well, they've uh, created uh, um, application, dedicated application for um, the news agency, uh, not only uh, a plugin to the uh, uh, Firefox browser, but also dedicated uh, Android application. Um, first again, they should know well how to use uh, even infograph and can see here one from uh, Hamas and the other one of Islamic State, uh, very visual, very informative. Another aspect is the cyber threats. Um, Islamic State had uh, at least two um, well, not necessarily uh, official organs, but those who were sympathizers um, that uh, um, looked themselves as uh, a, a part of Islamic State when it's come to the South space. One of them is Islamic State hacking division, and the other is cyber, Khalifat Saba army. This Khalifat Saba army later on uh, joined with some others to combine this united cyber caliphate. And they did some activities, as you can see in here, uh, Islamic State hacking division released addresses of 100 US military personnel, including pilots that attacks Koban, attacked Kobani. Uh, it was posted by this guy, Abu Hussein of Brittany, that um, if I'm not uh, wrong, he was, uh, um, hacker affiliated with uh, with Islamic State, um, and I, if I remember correctly, he was the first person, the first hacker that was uh, uh, killed by a U.S. drone. Uh, first hacker. Um, some other events were, as you can see here, um, hacking and leaking information. In this case, from uh, uh, Minnesota police, uh, details of uh, uh, 36 uh, officers. Um, hacking, in this case, to the Twitter account of uh, US Central Command, <clears throat> um, since it's uh, just uh, hacking into Twitter account, it's uh, not so sophisticated. It was made probably using social engineering, uh, the ability to uh, breach into this account, to change, uh, to replace um, it's a uh, 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 made photo into sub caliphate and then <clears throat> post messages in the name of uh, uh, Islamic State, as you can see here. ISIS is already here, we are new PCs in each military base, and so on and so forth. Uh, in addition, they managed to breach also um, the Twitter account of. Uh, um, um, Newspeak, but once again, it's not cyber attack. Uh, uh, breaching into a uh, uh, Twitter account or uh, such things, it's, it's mainly made using social engineering, which is, uh, as far as I see it, and that's what I tell to my student, 
social engineering, I do not consider it as a cyber attack. It's rather a, um, a fraud, an online fraud, because I ask for your password and you provide me your password. And another thing, that they made those uh, uh, hacker sympathizers of Islamic world, uh, Islamic, uh, pardon, Islamic State, is um, the facement of website. In this case, the website of Malaysia Airlines, and can see here um, 404, they not found, you know, it's, uh, um, I assume that it's related to MH370, the Malaysian airplane that uh, was not found up until now, um, and hacked by Saudi Khalifa. And they also invite you to follow their Twitter account. At the end of the day, when it's come to <clears throat> cyber activities, I think this is a very important invitation to say that ISIS never targeted US and European sources through cyber attacks except for script kiddies level of the facing website, as we saw just now, we do not expect them, nor Boko Haram, nor or al Shabab to execute real cyber attacks, which means, and we go back to the theme of this event, we do not expect them to execute real cyber attacks that may threat or, or, or harm national security by uh, um, attacking and harming critical infrastructure uh, uh, systems. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you for your time. Back to you, Loren. Thank you so much, Dr. Pavel. Thank you so much. And now we will go, uh, move on to the lectures. And the first one will be... Uh... <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Yes, okay, yeah. sorry. First one will be Joyten Jane, the director of Ojaya in Fosse. Are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Great. Okay. Uh, Joyten Jane is a leading cybersecurity expert, having specialization in geopolitical intelligence analysis um. and mapping them to global cyber conflict. He is currently heading Indian Infoje Confoyon an independent not-profit organization of leading cyber experts in India. He is also the co-founder of Voye Infose, a technology startup specializing in cyber threat intelligence. The 10 is a receipt of fellowship by British government and has studied cyber defense and information sureness at Defense Academy of United Kingdom. He is the youngest speaker to have addressed air commanders Conference of Indian Air Force. And Elijah is authority of cybersecurity, Amethi University, has confirmed him honorary professor, professorship. Uh, Jay Tang is also visiting facility in National Police Academy and Forging Service Institute of Ministry External Affairs. Jay Tang, it's yours. Uh, no, thanks, Lauren. That was a long just intro. A moment, I should send a short small, one. Small interruption. Just each panelist will sorry for the small interruption. Uh, each Enough, panelist so you will cannot hear a... you. C can you hear me now? Yes, it's can fine. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry for the, uh, the slight interruption. Uh, each panelist will have about 12 to 15 minutes to present their views. And uh, uh, after Mr. Jitin uh, will invite Dr. Oja. And Samit Patel will be, uh, Dr. Patel will be the last because I think he was in some meeting, so he'll be joining a little later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so should we start? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, thanks, uh, Lauren. And, uh, you know, excellent presentations by Dr. Carl and uh, Professor Bobby. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, I agree with uh, what Professor Bobby said that, you know, at the uh, end of it, it all lies how much do you love your state and whether you can overcome differences to have a uniform security policy across generations. And, and, and especially in a country when you are faced by hostile uh, borders, at least on the three sides, uh, no better country than Israel to understand that. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so that is a lesson that, you know, uh, political difference should not uh, affect uh, the security policy. Uh, the second, uh, you know, I wanted to cover how the cyber has been used by terror organizations, and I wanted to list four or five challenges. 
but two of them have been excellently put by uh, Dr. Thal in his presentations that how uh, terror organizations have been using uh, you know the online media and internet for recruitment and radicalization. I think if you look at his entire presentation, the way he showed that how ISS or Hamas have been using Telegram, social media apps, news websites, or you know uh, social media to radicalize and recruit people. I think challenge is much bigger today. Most of these incidents are of 2016, 17, and before. But if you look today, uh, the small migrant in the world, where an organization like Hamas had a physical territory in at Gaza, and you could use it for conducting full-scale terror operations and attack on a country like Israel, we have a bigger problem today. We have now one of the biggest terror organizations in the world which carried out mass executions on a football field which you know raped women which killed thousands of people in the broad daylight today is controlling a country called afghanistan and so this whole problem of having a teller or you know telegram account or using social media was to avoid attribution recruit people across territories and hide your identity but that challenge is not with them today they are openly doing it they are you know, openly running a full-scale battalion of suicide bombers on their, you know, public parade in the stadiums after taking over the government. So, which where in the world you will find suicide bombers being paraded as a you know mark of achievement? So, I think the since the terror organizations like Hamas or Taliban or Jaish e Mohammed, which is backed by Pakistani state, are no more worried about attribution or identity being revealed, they are now entering into a phase where beyond recruitment and radicalization, they are looking at capacities to, you know, get into a bigger game, use, uh, you know, cyber for espionage, for targeting critical infrastructure. We have seen a lot of Indian defense personnel being compromised by the cyber cell of terrorist organizations like JEM. And if you investigate, you realize, or beat Hamas also, that the technology always is used by them but it's always provided by another state operator. In our case, it may be ISI of Pakistan. In Israel's case, uh, you know, Hamas may be getting uh, the technology from other uh, benefactors from other uh, countries like Iran or uh, Syria. But the problem is that the technology is now available with them. If you, uh, and what, the only solution what you had to deal with this problem of social media radicalization and recruitment was to conduct massive surveillance you know, technical intelligence, but that is also now becoming a challenge. In last four years, we are seeing several incidents of terrorists trying to get into Indian borders, are not using mobile phones, are not using social media. They are now using those old times radios, ham radios, coupled with a smartphone, uh, where a smartphone has an app which encrypts the Morse code or the SMSs or the text or the voice they want to send. And that encrypted text is now being sent on an open radio. So oh, even if you intercept, uh, you can't figure out what it is. So a terror organization using technology for encryption coupled with the innovation of using old day radios, I'm sure that, I mean, they can definitely would have been using it. But the innovation definitely is not their cup of tea. It has definitely come from a state called Pakistan. Or in, you know, if you look at Hamas or ISIS, that the innovation has come from a different person and it has been supplied to the terror organizations to amplify their objectives. Uh, now, third challenge beyond that is of espionage. Now, for espionage, you need a good malware. That is it. And a good social media engineer with a you know, command over the language. And with the free availability of malware on internet today, I think uh, even technological innovation is not a challenge. The only requirement is money. If you can pay a million dollar, two million dollar, ten million dollar, you can get a good Android or an iPhone malware and you can start infecting phones, hack them. I mean, agencies across the world have been using it for surveillance. Rogue agencies have been using it for, uh, you know, conducting uh, terror operations by aiding the terror organization. Or terror organizations themselves will have no dependency on their backers. They will themselves start using it. So that is, I think, going to be a bigger challenge. Uh, another challenge, what in my CI force in last next five to seven years, is the use of autonomous vehicles by terror organizations. We have seen three incidents on uh, attack on Saudi Marco. You have seen what happened in Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, three days back. Hadi terrorists using you know drone to target uh, a facility in UAE. We have seen multiple instances of drones being used by terror organizations in Pakistan to hand drop weapons in India. 
an attempt to you know launch a grenade by using a drone so they are experimenting now some have been successful but if you look at next 5 to 7 years with the size uh, and capability of the cost of drones increasing and the cost coming down i think autonomous vehicles both in terms of uavs or underwater vehicles uh, say a small automated submarine drone being used by terror organization to target your coast so autonomous vehicles are going to be a bigger challenge a because they are affordable they are cost effective and to use them you don't need a suicide bomber from hamas or afghanistan all you need is a you know 5000 rupee drone and you launch the attack there is no one which is going to be caught now that challenge on a parallel is uh, setting off another challenge what about if these organizations are able to acquire automated bots you know the uh, robotized soldiers or autonomous soldiers using a robot to kill and target people and that day is not far the way you are having this self driving cars uh, just imagine a day where you don't have a suicide bomber driving a vehicle and ramming into a truck or a building you would have a autonomous car you know full of uh, rds trying to target a government building and this is now possible because this terror organization the time for acquisition of technology innovation is now reducing because they are now controlling countries taliban now has an air force taliban now has us backed weapons they are they are having a full scale supply of money so acquiring this technology or autonomous weapons is now only a question of money not a question of availability so if the problem of availability and innovation is gone the only problem is money i'm sure sooner or later taliban will have enough money to acquire this thing. so that is i think it going to be a bigger challenge uh, we will face and uh, communication i think is going to be challenge last i think you know see we we have another example of you know world being dependent now so much on money i mean uh, dr pal was showing how bitcoin was used for funding terror operations or paris attacks uh, you have north korean hackers which are almost trying to run their entire economy by hacking bitcoin exchanges uh, i mean you would have seen the news the day before that one of the biggest people in the world is now a founder of a crypto exchange with a wealth uh, which is equivalent to almost bill gates i mean the, this is the way a bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are creating wealth so if north korean hackers who are just hacking exchanges after exchanges stealing bitcoins currency money i think once rogue nations have enough money and then a mechanism to transfer that money avoiding conventional banking channels that tracking of money for any financial crime terror crime if that is not there i think then then again they have a free hand to operate in different geography which i think is becoming a challenge here in india also where uh, you know organizations like jashe mohammad or uh, lashkar e taiba have been using cryptocurrencies to transfer money to their uh, sleeper cells agents and i'm sure that may have been happening in israeli and the middle east too so how do we deal with that problem that is another challenge and last as i said you see now we are trying to solve our problems of hostile border by investing a lot in technology because we are like israel have one of the best you know uh, the software uh, economy in the world we have enough manpower to do those technological innovation so one of the best innovation israel did was uh, this uh, uh, you know uh, about iron dome that you have a incoming missile threat from hamas and you launch counter missiles and with 90 to 95% accuracy to take down this incoming threat uh, within a reasonable period of time saving israel israeli life now india is trying to build similar technology i mean in collaboration with israel we are experimenting on our own also that can we can we defend our borders from this incoming missiles which may be used by terror organizations but after so much of innovation so much of energy so much of success now you have another challenge that in the previous conflict i saw hamas launching balloons hamas launching small drones so imagine if and and you know for one incoming uh, uh, the missile to you know uh, uh, track that their trajectory and you launch two counters you see to if if there is an incoming balloon or a 2000 rupee drone to take down that drone if you have to fire a 25000 dollar missile and so imagine if if they were to just send 1000 uh, dollar you know 100 dollar 200 dollar small drones in as a swarm and you end up firing you know 100 missiles with each costing 25 30000 dollars the it is not a scalable model and for a terror organizations to just acquire 100 dollar drones from flipkart amazon it is possible and then you just launch 100 200 drones let that money go waste and you have consumed the entire security infrastructure uh, of the uh, uh, nation which is trying to protect by using the technology so i think the point i am trying to convey is that 
cyber always had a problem you know three four challenges one was a challenge of innovation the second was the challenge of availability and innovation and acquisition and third is obviously money so first two problems are for the world's biggest terror organizations are now gone uh, they don't have to innovate they can simply purchase they have backers in the form of states like pakistan afghanistan taliban or what we had isis you know run, running oil facilities or getting money now with the availability of cryptocurrency and the capability of hacking stealing money or availability of money through conventional cycles like by selling oil minerals uh, if you have money you can acquire anything in cyber and with the development of ai you do not have any physical transfer of technology that you can catch that some person was trying to you know smuggle 100 weapons or 100 bombs or 100 uh, weaponry you can simply uh, you know give the technology on a pen drive so how do you deal with this problem of ai handing into the landing into the hands of terror organizations and then being used to come, you know target innocent civilians i think this is going to be the biggest challenge of the next decade ai and autonomous weapons being used by terror organizations thank you so i wanted to thank you so much for the that interesting that enough time for others yeah yeah <laughs> thank you much for the interesting lecture and so now we okay. move on to our next uh, speaker a Colonel Dr. Indrajit Singh. Colonel In- Indrajit Singh is the Chief Cyber Security Officer, Head of the Cyber Security Center of Excellence at Vartav Technology. In, his, in this role, is instru- instrumental in uh, building the cyber security business unit for the group. He is working on the disrupted technologies in the cyber security space for searching IT networks. smart cities and critical information infrastructures. He serves in the Indian Armed Forces uh, as in Almonds of Indian Institute of Technology and Symbols Institute of Management. He is the Doctorate of Science from Logos International University, Florida. He is an experience in uh, information system professional with expensive of more than 29 years across a wide spectrum of area spanning cyber security operation leadership and influence policy level decision in multi fight uh, organization Conal is your state yeah. uh, thank you very much uh, Lord, and, uh, Lord, just a moment yeah Uh, and just uh, a moment thanks colonel brother Bra- i'm very sorry to interrupt uh, i just got a message dr ja has to leave like he has some urgent meeting to attend so would you mind if we can go yeah, first yeah, sure, sure, sure. okay uh, absolutely dr ja thank you thank you I, i'll just thank you i'll just take 15 minutes not more than that so my apology lauren i have interrupted you and deepest apology to indrajit <laughs> okay So I'll just uh, let me just uh, I mean briefing you can do I'm I'm just um, you can uh, I'm an expert and uh, you can say in cyber and counter terrorism and basically my domain forte is the West Asian Middle East. There are a couple of questions which I have seen from the starting. I was attending this lecture from uh, from the when uh, Consulate General of Israel was speaking and. Uh, man dr tal also speak i mean there is nothing left which i can show on i can roll on because he has already told that uh, how the uh, cyber is ma- manipulated compromised and everything is done but just wanted to share you couple of things which we are doing as in uh, from the government of india and as an in indians we are doing we are very passionate to work with the israelis and we are working very closely with them in the last meeting there which was there uh the india global summit in just last month in uae i was there in the high level diplomacy meeting where high com- uh, head of mission uh, strosta the israeli was there and uh, we in front of the foreign secretary we proposed that there should be a kind of a center for excellence for the ai and cyber security i mean just like on the concept of the five eyes surveillance which was created long time back in 1946 by the british intelligence so in that uh, uh, uae ambassador uh, head of mission from uh, israel in uae and australian ambassador everybody was there and we formed we decided that we should open a kind of a platform from where we can do and strengthen lot of other things which is there in fact that was the another area from where we were planning from uae we will go to tel aviv but unfortunately you closed the door because of the covid uh, and we were not able to travel to the tel aviv 
so we are planning to go there and we also want want to create a kind of a center for excellence i would like since uh, her, uh, the consulate general of israel is already on the panel so what he was saying trying to demonstrate that there is a center for excellence which israel has created on the soil of india we are also very much eager to uh, establish certain kind of a rnd centers and kind of a center for excellence in tel aviv and any other parts we are ready to take the people from there so do both the scientists can work together now when we are talking about uh, this is a very vast topic means i cannot summarize everything in just 15 minutes but i'll just cover two things that when we are talking about the south south asia ranks i mean it's the severely hit by the terrorism related incident and fatalities uh, during as of now i mean the three nations uh, like pakistan afghanistan as well as india were the, among the leaders leading 10 nation throughout the globe most affected with the terrorism and uh, then uh, i mean for countries in south asia you can say the particularly india the after the withdrawal of the us i mean there are repercussions and uh, the other uh, slipping cells and the other uh, neighboring countries uh, extremist group and the uh, terrorist group got activated because they found a big gap from where they can proliferate into the india and then come into the indian soil and do other things which were they were initially doing from their country, uh, soil now they have got a passage to move from there so when we are talking about the taliban and all other things i mean it's well understood they are doing things even when we are talking about the bitcoins we are working very sensitively for this particular the national security of the country for the mother india and we are always prepared for such kind of repercussion we are mentally prepared for those things also when we are talking about you we know very well that uh, the because uh, last to last month only the taliban has come with the taliban crypto so bitcoins is some of the major issues are there but uh, uh, we have taken so uh, all uh, cognizance that crypto was used in afghanistan and the taliban take over and then terrorist exploitation of the uh, cryptocurrency in the southeast asia how terrorists move funds through the global financial system that is also one of the major area where we want to work closely with the israel and uh, like how uh, charitable front we we have got some uh, inputs and we have got some evidence and we have seen that the, through the charitable fund organization the business and the criminal activity then the business controlled by the terrorist also then the charitable front organization then the individual ter terrorist operation then the state sponsors of the terrorism so these are some of the things which are there and uh, terrorist on the telegram as tal as dr tal has said yes they are there they have got a secured communication they can communicate android and iso messaging features they have got you just have to download and they basically create a high level of the encryption key where you can communicate from point to point so these are some of the areas but now the question is how to go about we know the repercussion we know the sensitization we know the dangers which are there on the border areas and we are doing so that basically which the meeting which got happened in the uae last month only that was the call because like it was it is to work very closely with israel in conjunction with the uae and uae ambassador was also the dr albana was there i was there and we proposed that we should immediately move this kind of things so that at least these uh, the clouds which are moving around we can tackle and i told them very clearly that see european unions have got their own consortium which is working on the data protection policies they are working on the cyber securities why we not so let us formulate so they said okay we can work on your concept of five eyes surveillance basically let israel india uae join hand together five countries and they can on the court basically and uh, we also are very much interested to create uh, fusion centers so where the cyber terrorism the cyber uh, activists the cyber terrorist and the cyber warfare i mean we can have a differentiation among these things and whole gambit we should be covered by the full spectrum cyber operation so i mean national data strategy should be israel and india is the former of the next wave of five innovations we know and we are working very closely with the defense also and with the law enforcement agencies in india and israel's are i mean but now it's a time that 
both the brain should work together so exchange of the ideas also we also want to work very closely with you uh, with the israel scientists and with the israel people and with the israel companies so that those things can be designed and developed and i mean it should be a kind of a benchmark for both the countries i mean our brain and your brain should conjoint together and then uh, there should be a kind of a process for the integrated review then the plan for digital regulation then the resilience strategy then net zero strategy there hell of the things we can talk about in 15 minutes here but the only in nutshell i just want to say you that we are very much interested and we have been uh, working very closely with israel's counterpart and uh, we want to move into the next generation now the next level of the things because they are always there we are in conjunction with the indian embassy the israeli embassy here now i told you that how we are moving we want to create the center for excellence in the field of ai quantum even uh, iot and many other things which will become the challenging aspects in due course of time we are talking about the smart uniform so more and more sensors are there the uniform more and more iot activities will go so how to capture how to create a kind of a activity based intelligence like big data how to clean those data how to segregate this data how to do the intelligence of those data so that's uh, all i just want to say because i know it's 12:30 and we have got couple of uh, i mean there are more uh, speakers who are left so i know this is from my side and any questions is there you can just let me know i will not roll on my presentation because it's just like on the line of uh, dr tal only so we have got many things telegram and all those so he has already covered so i think most of the things has been taken care and shalom thank you shalom thank you so much colonel indojat please yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, thank you dr uja also and uh, uh, thank you dr tal uh, kobi and uh, lauren uh, right really really very nice inputs which you are given and uh, tal you brought out the whole view of the cyber terrorism i know uh, leaving nothing for anyone but then i'll just try and put two points in particular you know one is the use of the darknet and you actually threw the light as to what they are trying to do in the darknet and uh, most of the terrorist yeah. attacks are been planned in the dark net right now right and that's uh, extensive usage of it uh, we need to have a kind of a fusion center where we need to identify how we are going to uh, light up the dark net to identify this criminals in the dark net right and that is where we have a major challenge which is going to be there and internationally different countries have to come together to monitor this darknet because there is still a lot of void while the different law enforcement agencies are working in silos to you know catch these criminals you need to have a real joint effort and the other aspect which is of course the point of concern today is the attack on the critical information infrastructure and while we everybody touched about the point of the iot the operational technology ot security becomes some most important factor we we are not been targeting the ot security right now and that's on the target of the cyber terrorists or the terrorists all together you know and that's a easy kill for them they can easily target the critical infrastructure put the city to the darkness darknet uh, uh, darkness and iot which are the sensors which are put together in any smart city and there's so many smart cities which have come up it's going to be a big challenge how we need to need to address those kind of challenges of securing the critical information infrastructure as a country in india also we got an organization which is looking into uh, the critical information infrastructure uh, uh, security part of it but uh, definitely there is a need for a holistic look on the critical information infrastructure how your power grid is not vulnerable how your uh, you know telecom networks are not vulnerable your hospitals are not vulnerable your road networks are not being challenged your uh, other networks which are there as part of the uh, critical infrastructure maybe a nuclear power plant is not been under the threat so those are the kind of targets which are there now the currency which has suddenly changed and we everybody spoke of the crypto and we know that there was a satka coin which came up built up by the criminals by the cyber terrorists asking for the donation 
Then we also saw some of the, the, the photographs put up by the ISIS on the internet asking for the donations. That's all there on cards with us now. You know, crypto is the currency by being used by the terrorist for transactions, and that's going to go long. But then it is a kind of monitoring which we require to do. We need to deface the people who are holding those wallets. Like, you know, uh, we were trying to investigate one of the wallets and we were able to go back to the wallet where the transactions emanated from somebody, ISS, ISIS guy in some of the jail. You know, those are the kind of things which are there. So we need to track those people. We need, we need to use the technology sure. right now. Because currency is crypto. Uh, the tool is the darknet. Of course, the telegram and all those things do come in the deep web part of it. You can monitor them if you are using the right kind of tool. Catch this uh, terrorist, you know, uh, uh, by the neck now, because it's become very important, right? So these are the kind of challenges which are there. The technology is the way forward. The law enforcement agencies of different company, countries, uh, different, you know, organizations, uh, have to come together, countries have to come together to, you know, talk of a, a joint effort. And Dr. Oja spoke of the fusion centers. Yes, that is the way forward. We need to have the fusion centers. Interworkability of different law enforcement agencies, different countries is the view, way forward for, you know, bringing up the, uh, the kind of situation where we are able to counter this terrorist who are actually moved to the to the cyber world, which has become a major challenge. So I will stop here because there are other uh, speakers as well. Uh, you know, though I could have covered much more, but posterity of time, I'll hand you over to Lauren. Thank you so much for the interesting lecture. Thank you. And now we will speak with Dr. Jay Jitin, as an assistant professor of national security at the Central University of Jammu. Prior to this, he worked as a research fellow in the Internal and Regional Security Program at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, IPCS, New Delhi. He is a former visiting research fellow at the Fordham University. He specialized in international security and public affairs with a focus on South Asia security and strategic issue. You're welcome. Um, no, thanks. Uh, Dr. Lauren, and thanks, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Tal and Abhinav, uh, for uh, giving this opportunity to share. Uh, I have prepared a brief slide, but uh, rather what I would, uh, I'm planning to do is that just to, based on uh, what I'm been hearing of uh, the previous speakers, um, I just like to highlight the few or flag up, flag a few issues, and also highlight some of the points uh, which I find it is very important and significant uh, in terms of uh, policy actions. <clears throat> Uh, first, I think uh, there is no doubt, and it has been there, that uh, the, the terrorism or the counter-terrorism is the uh, one of the area where uh, India and Israel can uh, uh, work together, and there's a huge potential to work on this counter-terrorism uh, aspects. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, the, the, and the another important aspect of this counter-terrorism is that uh, we uh, we need to have a uh, technology to uh, um, you know in, 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 in enhance our counterterrorism operations and, and that's where that india india needs uh, israel uh, to augment its counterterrorism efforts uh, that's a uh, there's no doubt on that point and i think it's very clear on that point uh, uh, the second issue which is my since i'm based in jammu and kashmir i've been here uh, teaching there uh, and also uh, observing the developments happening there, uh, there is a uh, what I can see that is that there is a uh, evolution in terms of the terrorist groups as well as uh, the modus operandi, uh, and it, it's uh, changing rapidly. And uh, every year they are changing their modus operandi. Uh, the first I would like to flag the issue of the cross-border terrorism, where the terrorist groups now are using this uh, uh, using a tunnel tunnels to uh, send their uh, arms and weapons. Uh, and for that became a biggest challenge for the border management border border management uh, by the our security forces uh, so uh, i think that here their israelis can uh, help in terms of uh, you know, how to detect these tunnels which is which is existing in the international borders to trace, trace. and that's become a biggest challenge uh, for the our um, uh, security forces in countering the terrorism uh, and they're not only bringing the weapons and also the uh, the uh, the drugs <clears throat> 
this the, the second issue is the in terms of operations I'm, i'll come to the cyber part later but i'll just to highlight this flag these issues an operational part and there's a sort of you know we need uh, more uh, technology uh, to on the counter terrorism front like you said in jammu kashmir the trend is now changing now even the terrorist groups which we uh, read or which we think that uh, they have been adopted to the new technologies like social media technologies or internet technologies but they are also now uh, move towards uh, creating those applications uh, rather than they are just mere using of those applications like luxury toyba uh, you know claim to have uh, creating more apps uh, for their own encrypted uh, communications Uh, that is a sort of alarming and dangerous uh, signs and i and we do we we lack i mean uh, sort of um, uh, awareness on that what's happening in their groups <clears throat> uh, what would like to flag uh, is that uh, these terrorist groups uh, as already been discussed about how they are using these social media platforms uh, to recruit uh, uh, and uh, they'll radicalize Uh, and and and, uh, and then sort of you know uh, triggering the violence uh, in the valleys in the valley particularly in jammu and kashmir but what i see is that there is a sort of this social media platform and this internet and the cyber space has created uh, 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 non violent extremist uh, constituencies uh, in the in the in, in our in, in in this part of the world uh, Uh, you know corner corner of you know sleeper cells um, uh, but quite active in these cyber realms we don't know uh, who is uh, uh, involving in it and may, maybe the person sitting uh, next to next to next to me or could perhaps you know could be part of that the dark net or be part of that uh, the non violent extremist uh, uh, groups i think that is a because the because of the biggest challenge that we face the third i think uh, abina would be the right person to uh, uh, comment on this uh, cryptocurrencies uh, but one thing is very clear that uh, we are only focusing on the crypto cryptocurrencies but what about the other payment banks which is also being maybe used for by the terror financing in a micro level and that is also a big challenge and do we have enough Uh, mapping technologies uh, technology to monitor and uh, 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 monitor these these groups which are been involved in it uh, again that is going to be uh, face a, a big challenge in jammu and kashmir now the today this new the new challenge is uh, not uh, not about the suicide bombings or uh, like you know uh, having an ideological battle it's more of a micro uh, level managed one with the with the uh, the new group called the, the resistance front which is offshoot of said to be an offshoot of let uh, which is quite active in social media platforms uh, in terms of propagating the fear and every incident happens it claims the responsibilities whether it is involved or not and also uh, very efficient in use in uh, 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 creating the fake news i think that's a biggest challenge the, to identify uh, uh, the 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 news or the fake news and how these groups are uh, uh, in the small short span of time could able to uh, flood the entire news portals with the fake news and the fake informations uh, the, and and they are also quite in, influential in uh, uh, among the students and the scholars communities in through whatsapp various social media platforms and that is also an alarming sign and using uh, other uh, internet services even when uh, 2019 after this abrogation of article 370 we witnessed Uh, there's a shutdown internet shutdown but uh, despite that shutdown we could see the activities of these groups uh, using the vpn networks and uh, some other um, uh, network communications uh, in terms of uh, pop- propagating um, the false narratives against the security forces so and that is an important uh, challenge the third last and uh, it is also an uh, alarming uh, threat that is a uh, drone strikes i would call the drone terrorism Uh, jammu witnessed a few drone strikes and drone attacks there 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 has been a pattern that the drones uh, could able to enter indian space uh, uh, in many areas like punjab and the border areas uh, but uh, for last year we we witnessed an uh, strike on the indian air force uh, station and uh, that is like a mere alarming situation there are military installations uh, military uh, army cantonment areas and how to protect and do we have enough technology to uh, detect these uh, low lying low flying uh, drones Uh, some of them are um, uh, with you know um, uh, with commercial drones i think that's where that's where we need to uh, have a more collabor- collaborations and uh, partnership uh, to identify the new, these new emerging threats and challenges and how we can uh, best uh, uh, optimally you know jointly or produce such technologies that can be uh, used 
Uh, the last is that what I find is that my interactions and I'm seeing this counterterrorism uh, operations by the armed the security forces. I find there is a lack of uh, coordination in terms of uh, processing the technical inputs and also using the prioritizing the technologies, which technology to use in which trade. I think there we need to have a streamline this training process. And uh, for that also, I think we can, uh, uh, there's a huge uh, uh, scope for uh, India and Israel uh, collaborations and uh, partnership in training the uh, security forces on uh, how to coordinate uh, efficiently coordinate uh, uh, when it comes to uh, you know operations uh, uh, processing the technical uh, inputs and technical uh, technology prioritizing the uh, technology uh, and these things uh, so these are the points which i'd like to share and i look forward to hear more uh, comments and questions thank you Thank you so much, Dr. J. Jentem. And for the next speaker, the last one, actually, uh, I want to introduce Dr. Samir Patil. Dr. Samir Patil is a senior fellow at the Observe Research Foundation, Mumbai. His work focuses on the instruction of technology and national security, including cybersecurity. He also researched India's national security priorities, counterterrorism, and regional security. Dr. Patil, has previously worked at the National Security Council, Secret Territory, and Getaway House, a foreign policy think tank in Mumbai. He is the author of Circuit India in the Cyber Era. Dr. Patil has done PhD and MPhil in international politics from the Royal Nauru University, New Delhi. He has participated in several Track 1 and Track 1 0.5 dialogues, including India, US, and India, UK strategic intelligence uh, dialogues after the two, uh, 2008 Mumbai attack, and India, UK track 1.5 cyber dialogue in 2019. He received the prestigious Canberra Fellowship Award by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Australia. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, Honorary Consul General, Honorary uh, uh, Consul General Kapish Shashrani, thank you for your really uh, insightful remarks. And I also want to thank Mr. Abhinav Panda and Dr. Tal Pavel uh, for their presentations as well as their teams for inviting me to, to speak today. My apologies for joining late as I was drawn into another commitment which took me away from the discussion for some time. So, as being the last speaker, I think my esteemed co panelists have already spoken about the various dimensions of this topic. So I think as the last speaker, my job would be to just summarize uh, what I've discussed so far. Uh, so I'm going to divide my remarks into three parts. Uh, firstly, I would like to discuss the state of terrorism uh, in South Asia. After lying low for several years, at least in terms of their public activities, uh, terrorist groups in South Asia, particularly those based in Pakistan, have felt encouraged since the takeover of the Taliban in August uh, 2021. As a matter of fact, since the fall of Kabul to Taliban, radical groups in Pakistan have become far more emboldened to question the democratic system in the country and call for the implementation of Sharia law. For India, of course, the withdrawal of the US uh, from Afghanistan brings back the painful memories of the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan in 1989, which marked the beginning of an armed insurgency in Jammu and Kashmir with the active blessings of the Pakistani military establishment. And there's a fear of history repeating itself. We have seen anti-India groups like lashkar e taiba and jaish e muhammad proclaiming even before the US forces had left Afghanistan that just as the Afghan Taliban had been able to defeat the US and Western forces, the Mujahideens in Kashmir too will defeat the Indian security forces. After the immediate fall of Kabul, we saw jaish e muhammad chief Masood Azhar meeting the Afghan Taliban leaders, including Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, to seek help for operations in the Kashmir Valley. As pointed out by the United Nations Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team, both lashkar e taiba and jaish e muhammad have for years operated in Afghanistan in association with the Taliban, the Afghani network and the, the Al-Qaeda. Operating under the umbrella of the Afghan Taliban in the eastern provinces of Punar, Nagarhar and Nuristan, both ADT and JEM have facilitated the movement of cadres which act as advisors, trainers and specialists in improvised explosive devices. The return of the Taliban will lead to the resurgence of many of these groups, in particular the Al-Qaeda, which has waited in the shadows for a decade 
since the killing of Osama bin Laden in 2011 in Abbottabad, Pakistan. The group had congratulated the Islamic Ummah for the Taliban's victory and called for the liberation of Kashmir as part of global jihad. Al-Qaeda South Asia branch, the Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, is considered an essential part of the Taliban insurgency and therefore difficult to separate from its Taliban allies. In fact, a crucial part of the US-Taliban deal signed in Doha in 2020 had required the Taliban to disallow Al-Qaeda from using Afghan territory for its operations and severe its relationship with Al-Qaeda. However, there is little possibility of this happening and in fact, with the increase in activities of the Islamic State Khorasan province, it is likely that Al-Qaeda will reassert its presence given the fierce competition between the two groups. And it is likely that the Taliban will rely on the Al-Qaeda to reign in the Islamic State Khorasan province even as the Taliban grapples with the challenges of governing Afghanistan. Of course, these developments have also once again reinforced Pakistan's persistence as the fountainhead of terrorism, posing a threat to regional stability and international security. Not just 9-11 attacks, but before that too, many terrorist attacks worldwide have their trails going back to Pakistan. Islamabad and Rawalpindi have pursued the policy of cross-border terrorism in its quest to inflict a thousand cuts to bleed India, and as a result, sponsoring terrorism has become an essential part of Pakistani statecraft, making it into a land of pure terrorism, a safe haven for the terrorists. And Pakistan has never been sincere whenever it assured the global community that it would perform its counter-terrorism obligations. This Pakistani duplicity has been on display since the 9 attacks. To escape the international scrutiny of its terrorist ecosystem, Islamabad and Rawalpindi have only engaged in a cosmetic crackdown on this network. We saw recently the concerning development related to the release of terrorist Omar Sheikh, accused of murdering journalist Daniel Pearl in 2002. And this incident once again has demonstrated Pakistan's flawed justice system and its impact on counter-terrorism scenarios in the region. Within Kashmir, recent events have shown that Pakistan's sponsored terrorist groups are regrouping themselves and floating new organizations like the Resistance Front, which have tried to expand their activities by targeting civilians and Kashmiri pundits with the clear aim of asserting their relevance. Fortunately, security forces so far have been able to nullify these efforts by acting in time. And I think it would be important to point out here that since India's move in August 2019 of withdrawing the special status of Jammu Kashmir and divide the state into two new administrative divisions of the Union territories, security forces have maintained an upper hand of the terrorist groups throughout. The second segment of our remarks is about the use of cyberspace by the terrorist groups and the way it has acted as a key force multiplier for these groups. While the Islamic State of the Daesh has lost most of its territory in Iraq and Syria, its ideology continues to resonate, inspiring thousands of vulnerable youth to engage in terrorist violence, including random acts and organized acts of violence, including in South Asia. In fact, Daesh's virtual propaganda frequently features India. If you look at the other groups like the Lashkar-e Taiba and Jaish e Muhammad, they too have used cyberspace and social media platforms primarily for radicalization, propaganda, and recruitment. In many cases, this propaganda is enabled by the support of the Pakistani military establishments, the Inter-Services Public Relations, which is the publicity unit of the Pakistan Army, which seeks to build an anti-Indian narrative on the social media platforms. It has honed this strategy over the years and continues to keep up with the viral trends on social media. This propaganda has been successful, as seen in the cases of Indian youth who travel to fight with a group in Iraq and Syria as well as the cases of Daesh-inspired lone wolf terrorists planning attacks in India. What we had seen a few years ago in Kashmir was that unlike the terrorists of the earlier generations, the new generation of terrorists was not afraid to reveal their identity. These terrorists frequently took to social media platforms, posing with their weapons, posting training videos and showing how they were not constrained in terms of their movements in the region. This was obviously designed to entice recruitment of the local youth. Of course, this increased social media presence also enabled the security forces to launch a crackdown on these terrorist groups. And as a result, we now see a complete radio silence by these groups on public facing social media. Now, they prefer to bring out statements and pamphlets highlighting their cause and claim responsibility for their attacks. Moreover, now after repeatedly defacing, uh, deplatforming 
from the mainstream social media platforms on the regular internet like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube for posting extremist content. Now after repeatedly facing the acts from the mainstream social media platforms on the regular internet like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube for posting extremist content, many terrorist groups have moved to the darknet platforms and encrypted messaging apps such as Telegram to spread their propaganda. Cadres of the terrorist groups have also used the Onion router for their operational security. The Ansar Ghazwatul Hind, which is the Al Qaeda affiliate operating in the Kashmir Valley, has frequently advised the use of virtual private network and their TOR technology to avoid interception by the security forces. The use of these tools exponentially increased after restrictions were put on the internet in August 2019 in the Kashmir Valley. And that brings me to the third and last part of my remarks. The threat of the TOR technology enabled Darknet as a major cyber threat to India's national security. Hosted on the deep web and beyond the open traffic of the regular internet, Darknet has become the mainstay of cyber criminals and organized crime syndicates. Darknet marketplaces buy and sell prohibited goods such as drugs, firearms, stolen personal and financial data, counterfeit items, malware, and computer viruses. They also cater to the extreme perversions of humanity, such as contract killing, snuff movies, and child pornography. Law enforcement agencies have noticed the use of tor enabled browsers and growing activity of the India-based users on the digital black markets. Many of these sites have made available stolen and counterfeit identification documents, such as PAN cards, passports, Aadhaar cards, voter registration cards, as well as credit card numbers. In other instances, these websites have also been selling exotic and rare items from India, such as stolen idols and sandalwood. However, the most important threat posed by these marketplaces is by the sale of drugs and other narcotic substances. They offer drug users and the drug peddlers a convenient platform to engage in their activities. Marketplaces such as the Majestic Gardens, Neptune Market, and Empire have India based vendors offering Indian opium ketamine, hashish, and prescription pills to customers in India and abroad. And this online drug sale is the most pernicious aspect of the dark web because it complements the well-entrenched offline smuggling syndicates that operate in India's border regions such as in Punjab, JNK, and the Northeast. These syndicates have used India's proximity to the two global drug trading hubs, the Golden Crescent of Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan towards the west and Golden Triangle towards the east, which consists of Thailand, Laos, and Myanmar, to create active illegal corridors. These are used not just for drug smuggling, but also for trafficking counterfeit Indian currency and small arms, facilitating the movement of terrorists across borders and human trafficking, especially of women and children, for commercial sexual exploitation. And policing the dark net has proved difficult. While India is expanding its technical and cyber forensic capacity in the cyber criminal investigations, there are challenges of manpower and funding. I think here, partnerships with like-minded countries like Israel will really help to strengthen the existing counterterrorism and security partnership between India and Israel. I'll stop here and look forward to the comments and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Samit Patil. Thank you. So now we're going to move to the questions. Um, I have already some questions to ask you. So it's going to be general to all the speakers and who want to answer, you're welcome. Um, so the first one is um, request the panel to answer my doubt. Is India government open up to cyber diffusion without making a adequate processionary arrangement because we are a Turgonian country with less uh, infra infrastructure that could uh, cover all of India? And what is the role of U UNO and the role of regional trade blocks? Dr. Tal, maybe you want to answer about that? Um, I'm afraid that it's not related to my uh, domain, but uh, maybe. someone from, from uh, no, our, our, our uh, speakers. Oh. Yes, Colonel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll just answer. So there is a proper, you know, thought process which is already on uh, from the Indian government perspective, and we are coming up with a national cyber strategy uh, this year, which is going to actually look in from a very holistic view of 
the not the cyber diffusion the cyber fusion okay and where we are going to have a strategy for uh, taking care of your critical information infrastructure in even your influence you know warfare uh, we, it's a less spoken word because we always talk of information warfare we're also going to be discussing about the influence warfare on the social media with uh, all the terror groups really focus to you know radicalize people radicalize you know uh, their teams to launch the attack so we are also going to come up with that so there's a whole lot of huge thought process already on the table there's a lots of discussions which are already uh, uh, in the closed doors we are going to come up with a strategy which is going to be the guiding path for the country of course and it is all, also talking of uh, you know uh, working in cohesion with other countries as well so it's a very important document which is going to be uh, coming up very shortly thank you thank you so much the next question is a uh, day terrorist do it and run strategy and will switch technologies at random pace so what a uh, So are we in this process of building a comprehensive of firewall? And the next one, if terrorist invasions are like sparks, they need a grant to make the fire to glow. What kind of society national security administrations collabor collaboratives are on? Okay, I'll take the first question from Naveen itself, right? So uh, most of the law enforcement agencies, national, state in India, uh, they are now geared up. with the open source intelligence of the and checking on the active presence of the terrorist groups criminals who are there trying to you know monitor their activity trying to create the complete uh, threat landscape of those people trying to you know join all the dots of those criminals of the terror groups right so we are trying to work on on a strategy where we have the prior knowledge of things on the on on the social media network if they are present number one point number two point i uh, just told you about the influence warfare which is combating the terrorists on the social media right and we spoke of you know all the speakers spoke of the information disinformation warfare the uh, the the twitter warfare you know the information on the twitter in the dark net which is like being pushed to different people so how do you really combat that and the fake news also right so those are the kind of things which are going to be there then something which we didn't touch on the ai and we talk of the deep fakes when we talk of the ai right so terrorists are equipped for, with those those tools as well in times to come right with the deep fakes whether it's, whether it's a voice or photograph or video so to change the narrative itself and this is what we have been seeing in the past so uh, there are tools in the uh, with the government is looking at procuring them equipping the teams training the teams and and the capacity building by the law enforcement agency is the major thrust which is happening right now because uh, most of the law enforcement were in the other form of uh, you know trained uh, personnel in uh, the terrorist uh, you know fighting but the cyber terror the people uh, fighting in the cyber, cyber is a totally a different ball game so they are equipping them they are training them the monitoring of the crypto forensics is another area right on the social media along with the social media so well, net net there's lots of things which are happening if you look at uh, the complete uh, holistic view of uh, you know countering the terror groups on the social media itself thank I you so much i hope it answers your question thank you at the next one can you please uh, comment about the use of uh, al in combating this terrorist group who shows active presence in social media and although the talk of al and the cyber warfare is important but what about a uh, suicide bombers being as a sanctioned by now a uh, state actors like taliban uh just a second i think that uh, mr jain uh, wanted to um comment on the yes of course question uh am i right mr jain Uh, yeah, uh, so that's fine. She can carry on with the next question. Probably we can accommodate stuff. No, no, you can comment, please. It's okay. I will repeat again. No, no, you can you can complete the question, uh, Lauren. I will be good. okay. Sorry. Uh, so I will ask again. Uh, can you please comment about the use of AL combating these terror groups who shows active uh, presence in social media? And although the talk of AL and cyber warfare is important, 
but what about suicide bombers being uh, san san sanctioned by the now state actors like Taliban? And uh, okay, you can comment now. So there are two things. One is, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure in, uh, our agencies, including many other uh, uh, security agencies across the world, uh, now are doing active social media monitoring uh, with embedded AI ML based predictive intelligence capability. So you are not only mining social media for sentiment or some chit chatters based on keyword, you are also trying to predict, uh, you know, patterns based on, uh, say, weather, time of attacks or the chatter within the uh, particular network. So I think there is enough, I mean, not to put in public domain, but there is enough AI and ML capability, at least with Indian agencies, where they are using predictive intelligence to uh, deal with a, a you know, prospect of attack being carried out or a massive demonstration being carried out. But for a lone wolf attack, like, you know, maybe a suicide bombing or something, uh, there was a very, um, you know, interesting incident in uh, Kashmir two years back where Kashmir was under lockdown a communication blockade uh, to protect lives of citizens because there were the strong possibilities of riots happening on the street of Kashmir when Article 370 was removed. Uh, it was figured out uh, that uh, around at 80 to 90 places, these terror organizations or separatist groups had set up private GSM networks by using openly available hack RF technology. So you could like use $5,000 equipment to set up a private telecom network, which would work in a periphery of five kilometers. So government blocked internet, government blocked GSM communications, and they set up their own private network of telecom devices. Now, around at 80 such places, these uh, fake telecom towers or private telecom towers were detected. Now, those telecom towers can be used for IED blast. They could be used for carrying out conspiracy, communication, all those things. So I think one of the most emerging challenges now is that we have enough AI and ML capability to analyze text, photos, images, and videos. But when it comes to real-time analysis of audio calls, you even today need a human intervention to listen to the call because of different languages, dialects, and the, you know the words which are being used uh, to describe a bomb, like you know, sweet shop, or something. So I think the emerging new AI uh, activity, what we are is that we are trying to embed AI on a live audio conversation. So if two people are talking about, say, that I want to deliver a box in the front of a consulate, so meaning might be they want trying to deliver some sort of packet or a box. So can AI detect it in real time without human intervention? So I think that is an emerging area. But for text and photos and videos, we are having fantastic AI, facial recognition, and enough predictive intelligence to deal with them. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Shashani, I want to ask you some questions, if it's OK. Yes, yes. Okay. So earlier you said that uh, you are building um, an, uh, a cyber excellence center. Can you tell about, about this? As I think that I've mentioned in my, uh, in my lecture, cooperation is the most important. And I think that uh, in this case, we thought, uh, Ambassador and I, and it's, uh, it's only an, an idea because we, we need the cooperation. We need cooperation and we need to bring the know-how uh, in uh, this uh, field. We thought about an idea of like building a center of excellence in agriculture to build up a center of excellence uh, for cyber. And uh, I, of course, propose uh, Pune because uh, Pune is uh, in my uh, jurisdiction and I think it's a fantastic place to build such a place uh, because of the university, because of a lot of uh, high tier uh, company, great young generation. Uh, and right now, of course, uh, we apply for a budget for that because we need to put some, uh, some money. Of course, the uh, Indian companies, the universities, uh, 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 governments need to put as well money. But this is part of the cooperation that, we, uh, that I've mentioned before. Uh, we need the new young generation in India and Israel to know, first of all, that what we are you're talking now, it's not only a, a, a bites that moving from, from this place to another, it's a risk for the national security. And whenever uh, people uh, have the talent and the possibilities to fight against these uh, terrorists and criminals, it will be much more effective. I hope that I answer your question. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Pavel, do you want to add something? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Lorraine. Um, it was a very interesting, enriching, and inspiring event. 
in which um, we uh, had the participants of uh, um, esteem and uh, respectful, respectful speakers uh, from wide range of uh, uh, institutions and industries in India, and of course, uh, 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 Mr. Shashani as a representative of uh, Israel. Um, we saw the importance of uh, um, a cyberspace, <coughs> the threats that uh, may arrive from uh, um, terrorist organizations um, in India, in the Indian subcontinent, and uh, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, the importance of uh, uh, subspace, uh, and perhaps more than that, the importance of uh, cooperation uh, between organizations, institutions, and in this case, between states, Israel and uh, India, in order to uh, tackle, mitigate, and confront such uh, 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 threats that in some cases are common, uh, and have the same uh, um, threats, uh, in this case, to both countries. Um, I would like to thank, um, before the uh, uh, closure and summary by uh, uh, Mr. Abinab, I would like to thank... Uh, no, Dr. Pavel Abinab, it's not here, no. Pardon? You will summarize, okay, because okay. Abinab... Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so thank you all the uh, uh, um, attendees and participants, all, uh, of course, you, our moderator, Ms. Renda Ganamos, um, every, every one of our uh, uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Kobi Shoshani, uh, Council General of Israel to Mumbai, India, uh, Dr. Nishakant Ojha, Chief Strategy Officer and Aerospace Security uh, Bass, uh, Jitan Jayan Pardon, Director of Voyager Infosec, uh, uh, Mr. Samir Patil, Senior <coughs> Fellow, uh, Observer Research Foundation, Colonel Indrajit in Pardon Singh, uh, Chief Sub Security Officer at Vara, Te uh, Vara Technology, and <coughs> Dr. J, uh, Jagan Khan. Uh, Assistant Professor, Department of National Security Studies at Central University of Jammu, and of course our moderator, Brian De Ganamos, Research Fellow, International Institute for Migration and Security Studies, Haifa University and Bar Milan University, and above all, <clears throat> Mr. Abhinav Pandya, uh, founder and CEO of uh, um, Usanas Foundation, my uh, partner for the organization of uh, uh, this event, terrorist organizations in South Asia and cyber threats to national security. Thank you everyone for being part of this event. We do hope that um, it was a fruitful and reaching event and we are um, looking uh, forward to see you in our next events. Thank you very much, take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe next time it will be face to face and not in Zoom. Uh, wish you all the best and good health. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Abinav, do you want to add something? Say thank you. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, my apologies for not being able to be prepared for the summary part because I have an appointment with the dentist. But uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, all the participants and all the discussants today. My special and very sincere thanks to Honorable Consul General uh, Kobi Shoshani, sir. Sir, thank you very much for uh, um, outlining all the different areas for cooperation between India and Israel. And we really look forward to this very emerging and robust partnership. And my sincere thanks to uh, all esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Patil, Dr. Jagan, Dr. Oja, Colonel Brar, and uh, Mr. Jitin Jain. Thank you very much for coming out with your thoughts and your insights on this very critical issue. Because personally also, I feel that, I mean, this is the, something which uh, I came across uh, during my Kashmir experience and uh, especially the terrorists moving on uh, uh, to new domains like using AI and cyber for some kind of weapon systems. I mean, moving from radicalization and online recruitment to the other areas. Like in one incident, I came across uh, someone who was uh, coordinating with the Lashkar and they were planning to use uh, 
uh, uh, Wi-Fi operated IEDs, which could be operated like you know uh, uh, controlled from a distant uh, place, and you know they uh, they could be used to explode a high-profile official's office or a vehicle or something like that. So this is really a very serious concern. Okay? And once again, my sincere thanks to our partner organization, Cyber Bureau, Dr. Tal Pavel, and also to our moderator, dear Lauren. Thank you very much. And my team members, Akshay, Preeti, and Mihir, who are present today. Thank you very much. Looking forward to see you again in all our future events. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Pleasure meeting everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.